All right. At this time, we're going to sing, your bulletin say something different, but we're actually going to sing number 255, Blessed Assurance. And just 
for the purposes of demonstration this morning, we're going to pretend that the little pulpit here is the moon. And we're going to come over here. Sandra, I'm going to move your guitar because I sit here. And uh, we're going to pretend, I don't know if you're following me, are you following me? Probably not. <laughs> You're not supposed to move. <laughs> so for people at home, I moved from the little pulpit. The, the, little, the little pulpit is the moon this morning. Okay? Follow me. <laughs> the big pulpit is the earth. For now. So, if we want to get to the earth, over to the moon, can't walk, can't drive, can't take a plane, there's really only one way to do it. We need to have a spaceship oh. <laughs> of some kind. Now, this isn't the spaceship they had to go to the moon, although I'm sure you recognize the spaceship. They had a rocket, but we need some kind of spaceship to go to the moon. So we leave the Earth. And if you're halfway along, and uh, maybe you're getting tired of the spaceship ride, and you're thinking about getting out. What's going to happen if you get out? You die. You're going to die. <laughs> so, so you see, the spaceship is going to the moon, and if you want to get to the moon, the only way you're going to get there is if you stay in the spaceship. So, <laughs> okay, now we've gotten to the moon, and. We're happy because we stayed in the spaceship and we didn't die. We had to rely on the spaceship to get to the moon. More on this later. <coughs> now, how does all this have anything to do with, with uh, what I'm talking about this morning? Well, here's the thing. Has anybody here ever heard, you know, maybe you've been talking to somebody about the idea of salvation and they just kind of say, well, you know, I've done my best to live a good life, and I think I'm a pretty good person, and I think God will see that, and I think I'll be all right. Ever seen anybody with that kind of mentality? Yeah, sure. We all have. But the truth is, being good and being kind to others, while very admirable, you know, that's great, it's not enough. Because being good doesn't address our sin problem. You see, it's not as though our lives are weighed on some sort of spiritual scales. You know, if we've got one side with more good on it than the side that has bad on it, we may weigh more in the good so then we get to go to heaven. That's not how it works. Or even if, it's, if it weighs more on the bad side, then you go to heaven. That's not how it works. Quite frankly, if you've got any sin at all, your default is you go to hell. <laughs> so, we all have sin, right? Right? Yeah. So it doesn't work that way. But yet people suppose if they've done more good in their life than bad, God will reward them by taking them to heaven when they die. It's a nice theory, I suppose, and it probably seems just to most people, but it really has nothing to do with what the Bible says about being saved. After all, why would we need to call it salvation if it had anything to do with you and how good and or bad you are? If it had to do with you, how good you've been at works and stuff like that, no need to call it salvation. Salvation, the word itself, suggests that we are basically helpless. And that we need somebody to reach out and rescue us. Imagine, if you will, a child out in the water who doesn't know how to swim and they're flailing around because they can't swim and they're about to drown. They can't help themselves. They need somebody to swim out there and get them, or somebody to throw them a life preserver or something. 
something to rescue them. That's what being saved suggests. The fact is, we all have a sin problem. And Jesus Christ is the only person who has ever lived that knew no sin. The rest of us know it all too well. As it says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have to be able to do something about our sin problem. We can't just cover it up by doing more good than we do bad. And this has always been the case. Even in the Old Testament, before Jesus came, they had the whole sacrificial system to address the fact that sins needed to be atoned for. The blood of an innocent animal was shed to make atonement for the sins of the people. This foreshadowed the sacrifice of Christ, who, as John the Baptist declared, in John 1 29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was the perfect man, the second Adam, as the Apostle Paul called him, and the only person who could ever, once and for all, sacrifice himself for the sins of the people. You see, the blood of bulls and goats could never permanently atone for sin, but rather they just covered sin until such time as Jesus came and made the final perfect sacrifice for the sins of mankind. That's why under the Old Covenant, you see, these sacrifices had to be made again and again. It was never just a one-time thing. Well, now we've sacrificed the, the spotless animal and, and the blood has been sprinkled on the temple or sprinkled on the altar in the temple there and it's all good, we're done forever. No, it was never like that because the blood of animals could not perfectly atone for the sins of mankind. There had to be a perfect man to do that. That's why we needed Jesus. In Hebrews 10, 14, it says about the sacrifice of Christ, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. By a single offering. That means when Jesus died on the cross, that one sacrifice for sin covered all the sins you ever committed, all the sins you're currently committing, and all the sins you will commit in the future. One time, a perfect sacrifice for all time, for all mankind. If you're a genuine believer and follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's talking about you. Because you are in Christ. You have been justified by the blood of Christ, and that means you are now saved. It's not about how good you are. You are not saved one day and not saved the next day, depending how good or bad of a day you've had. It's not about performance from day to day. It's about where you are at in Christ positionally. Many of you have heard it said that faith is the key to salvation. As we're told in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God not by works, so no one can boast. Your salvation is a gift to you. It doesn't come by works. It's not made up of how good or bad you are from day to day. It's where you are at, positionally. If you are in Christ, you are saved. If you're outside of Christ, you're not. So yes, salvation depends on where we're at with Jesus, and not on our own ability to be good. It's about true faith in Christ. Not just believing He exists, but accepting Him as Lord and Savior. Now many of you may still wonder, how does this work? How do we get there? How do we take that step 
How do we proclaim our faith in a way that will save us? So this is where we get to one of our scriptures this morning, John 3, 1 through 7. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he's old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be reborn. Or, yeah. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of the water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. So, this brings up the obvious question, what does it mean to be born again? Well, let, we can go to Titus 3, 5, part B, which says, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. You see, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And we go from being a person who has only been born of the flesh and who is tainted and ruined by sin to being a person who is born of the Spirit, made alive in Christ. That old man of the flesh was ruined by sin. But Christ offers you a new life in him. A new life where you get to be accounted as righteous before God because of that second Adam, that innocent man who went to the cross to be that final sacrifice for your sins. Because he went there as an innocent man. And you and me need to become new men and new women. All of mankind needs this opportunity to become new again. New creations in Christ. Born again. Not the same old dead in our sins person of the flesh, but a new person made alive in Christ. How do we do this? Hebrews 11.6 tells us, Without faith it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. We must come to him in all sincerity, with a genuine heart, and confessing him as Lord and Savior. When you believe in your heart, you are believing in the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You are believing in his death and resurrection, which brought about the victory over sin and death. You must understand that you cannot save yourself. You cannot make yourself right with God without the blood of Christ shed for your sins. Therefore, true, genuine faith that believes in the heart and confesses with the mouth must start with repentance. And I'm not just talking about saying the words, I repent. No, it's an attitude of the heart that a person comes to in life where they are so sick and tired of the old way of sin. Walking around in the muck and the mire of death. That they long to be free. And they cry out for somebody to save them. 
Just like that kid drowning out in the water. The heart that understands the weight and guilt of sin and longs to move in a different direction. Right? We're going one way. We're living for ourselves. We're walking in sin. We're being ruined. We are ruined. We're being ruined more. We're tired of that. We want to go a different way. And we look over here and we see Jesus and the life that he lived. And that's beautiful and that's good. And we want to start going that way instead of toward sin and death. That's what repentance is. It's a change of your heart to desire something different. 2 Corinthians 7.10 tells us godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. Our desire to be done with the ways of sin and death are what lead us to salvation. True salvation in Christ. Therefore, salvation is about reaching that place in your life where you've had enough of the old sinful way of living. And you're ready to truly follow Jesus. Not only to new life and a clean slate, but to wherever God may lead you. You're ready to submit to the call and leading of God in Christ. Wherever that may be. There's an old Statler Brothers song. And there's a line in it that says, Wherever he would take me is better than where I've been. I believe he died for me, so I believe I'll live for him. That's a favorite of mine. And that's really what it's all about. So if you've been born again, if you know what I'm telling you this morning, if you've known this, then you can be sure that your salvation is accomplished. You don't have to wonder from day to day, am I going to be good enough really in the end to go to heaven? Because that's not what it's about. If you've been born again, if you've committed your way to Christ with a genuine heart, then you are in the position where you need to be. You are accounted as righteous because of Christ. It's not on you, it's on Him. But if you haven't been born again, if you haven't understood these things I'm telling you this morning, today is your day. Today is your day to get right with God through Christ. And if you still don't understand how that works, I'd be happy to talk with you more about it. I've laid it out for you, what it really is. So where does that leave good works? Do they really matter at all? Well, yeah, they do. For a couple of reasons. The Bible tells us there'll be rewards for good works when we go to heaven. But it also is proof that our faith is genuine. We learn from the book of James that true faith must bear fruit. And Paul confirms this in the book of Acts 26, verse, uh, chapter 26, verse 20, part B, says, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. Good works are the fruit of anyone who is truly saved. But they're not the cause of that person's salvation. If you're truly in Christ, if you're truly tired of going one way that is muck and mire and death and sin, and you've truly decided in your heart that following Jesus is the better way to go, that's the way that leads to life. then yes, that is salvation. Crying out to God, save me, make me clean 
in Christ. I don't want to be that old person anymore. I want to be this new person in Christ. But if that's happened, then guess what? You're going to change. You're not going to stay that old person who did all that rotten stuff. Because you're following Jesus now. And Jesus is good and perfect and teaches us about love and justice and mercy. And if we're following him, man, we're going to become more and more like him. That's how it works. Now, your salvation is firmly rooted and planted in the person of Jesus Christ. Not on your ability to be or do good. God is good. Jesus is God. And if you're in Christ, then your salvation is 100% secure. Now, we're going to reverse the order here. A little bit ago, this was the moon, and that was the earth. Now we're going to say this is the earth, and the big pulpit is heaven. And just like we needed the spaceship to get from the earth to the moon, and if we got out of the spaceship we were going to die, because the only way to get there was in the spaceship, well, now we're going to say... The spaceship is Jesus. And if you're in Christ, you're a passenger on the ship that's going to heaven. And so we can move along. Follow me. We can move along on our journey to heaven. And if it feels kind of tough somewhere along the way, do we get out? No. What happens if we get out? We die. Yes. But the ship, or Jesus, is going to heaven. We stay in Christ, we get to heaven. That's how it works. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he went to the cross and shed his blood for our sins so that we could be reconciled to you, so that we could know you through him, and that in him we can have the assurance of our salvation each and every day until we are reunited with you in heaven. In Jesus' name.